Guys, Rook Shahania, thanks for joining me for this video on the eve of Australia Day. And the vandals are hard at work. That's right. Melbourne statues of Queen Victoria and Captain Cook vandalized on Australia Day Eve. As you can see in this image, we have uh, Captain Cook there on the floor. He has been sawn off at the feet and they have written on the uh, monument there, the colony will fail in red. Uh, we also had Queen Victoria statue. Uh, there we go. Um, splashed with red paint. Uh, I'll just read a little bit of this article. Police are investigating after a Melbourne statue of Captain Cook was sworn off at the ankles and a monument to Queen Victoria was dubbed in red paint on the eve of Australia Day. The Captain Cook Memorial plinth at St Kilda was graffitied with the words the colony will fall and the sworn off figure of the British explorer was laid on the grass in front of it. Police said the members of the public had reported the vandalism about 3.30 a.m. and several people were seen loitering in the area around the time of the incident. Uh, in 2022, the same statue was splashed in red paint. So this was uh, 2022. This has been happening almost every year. We have these statues and monuments that, that uh, celebrate Australia's past or history or pay recognition to significant figures of Australia's history being vandalized in the lead up to events like Australia Day. Uh, the council, uh, apparently they were caught off guard. Normally they have a, uh, a camera unit or something monitoring this place, but they're saying they came a day early and they got caught off guard. Now this is Port Phillip Council. They've taken the, the statue away. Who knows if they'll bring it back. But clearly uh, these attacks on the history of Australia are continue. And look, I don't believe personally that this has much to do with the date of Australia Day at all. These activists who are involved in this just hate this country, just hate the history, just hate everything about Australia and they want to see it destroyed. That is my personal belief. This thing that they've written here, the colony will fail what colony? Australia is not a colony. It's a country we're federated <laughs> in the 19, early 1900s. This is not a colony anymore. We have a complicated history, of course, but there's a rich history of good and bad that makes this beautiful country of Australia today. And yes, we should deal with this history in respectful manner and we should address uh, grievances that people have. But all in all, Australia is not a failed colony and the colony will not fail. Australia is actually a very successful country for uh, for a nation that's been only, only, only around for a few hundred years compared to countries which have been around for thousands of years and those migrants keep pouring into countries like Australia uh, and then these people are talking about failure. I think we're in the top 20 economies of the world amongst other things. So we're a very successful prosperous nation despite our faults and I think a lot of this nonsense is really about these activists amazingly left-wing activists uh, and I'm, I'm basing that off the commentary I'm seeing online because they're celebrating this they're saying this is not a big deal and I'll show you some of those posts soon let me know what your thoughts are uh, do you support the destruction of monuments uh, related to Australian history do you believe we should have our all history wiped like some of these left-wing activists believe because that's not important anymore now, some activists uh, online, uh, this author, for instance, was saying that pulling down statues of colonizers is not erasing history. It's making history. It's showing the time we live in, a time in which those statues are no longer acceptable. Captain Cook statue toppled in St. Kilda on the eve of 26 January. So for these, uh, you know, these agitators, these left-wing vandals, uh, for them, in their mind, uh, the vandalism of property is about creating history now. Okay, this is how they're portraying it. So this is not necessarily a bad thing. This is almost an invitation, even though this person later says that he's not telling, uh, she's not telling people to go out and destroy things. Uh, this this initial statement pretty much justifies the destruction of uh, these type of historical monuments and figures if they believe that there is some sort of evil uh, relationship to the history of this country or whatever they want to term it as. So whatever they believe means that it can be destroyed for that purpose. Again, interesting uh, from these left-wing lunatics in many, many cases. Uh, we also have the Free Palestine Movement. So activists here in Victoria who are very involved in the organization of the pro-Palestine rallies. And for me, this is not a shock to see them talking like this because I've seen this type of language used by them uh, throughout the protest and other commentary that they do online. But this is what Free Palestine Melbourne has said. In other news, Captain Cook statue in Melbourne has been sawn off. May all colonies fall. And as you can see, uh, PSA Unions for Palestine, they are this week, they'll be, uh, you know, tomorrow, they'll be marching with the Invasion Day rallies in support of the Invasion Day rallies against Australia Day. And this whole concept about decolonizing Australia and removing settler colonialism around the world. So 
these things are linked together. The nexus of these ideologies from these activist groups who are involved in this uh, is very apparent in their language that they use. Here we have a Palestinian Aboriginal flag being put together saying, from the river to the sea, always was, always will be. Again, the nexus is very clear here. Again, I'm not saying this represents the majority of Palestinians that may call Australia home and love this country, but at least the activist class who actively participate in creating some of the disharmony we're seeing in our societies and the destruction of these uh, monuments and so on, they are all for it. This is their you know, bread and butter in terms of uh, vandalism. It, it, is, it is a part of it. Now, I'm not saying this group in particular, but as you can see, the Free Palestine Movement at least has professed some type of support for the concept of these colonies uh, failing or falling. Uh, moving on, we also have uh, Anthony Albanese, uh, you know, these stage three tax cuts, these broken promises. Now, I'm not an economist or a financial expert to go into de great detail about this. But what, from what I can see is clearly a, a promise has been broken here. Uh, these guys during the election, at least a hundred times it's been noted. Now people look looking back to the record promise that they will stick to the time frames and the guidelines around these strange three tax cuts. Now Anthony Albanese, of course, has flipped on this and come out with a different plan. So he's saying the promise isn't broken. They've just restructured it to uh, help lower income uh, earners in this country. And, you know, it's, it's been pushed off as a good thing by Anthony Albanese and a lot of his supporters. But a note that's been made by many is that, yes, the stage three uh, tax cuts were initially designed to target higher income earners in a different uh, bracket of their income. But the stage one and two tax cuts, which, uh, which was also pushed by the coalition and put through, targeted those lower income uh, workers anyway, right? Those lower income groups anyway. Again, I'm not a full expert on this, but just that logic that one and two uh, was around lower income, middle income earners in Australia, and then stage three was a different income bracket is my understanding. So Anthony Albanese has rejigged it up and he's also again gone to the lower income owners and middle income owners here in Australia. This is what the article says. Anthony Albanese has defended breaking a major election promise by over overhauling the stage three tax cuts, arguing changed economic conditions forced his hand as he seeks to win back middle Australia. The Prime Minister addressed the Nation's Press Club on Thursday to unveil his plan to slash the tax cuts for higher income earners in favour of bigger breaks for those earning under $150,000 per annum. For me, our responsibility is clear. This is the right decision, not an easy decision, he said. Over the summer, senior Treasury and finance officials were asked to canvas options for providing cost of living relief for Australians. So this is all a part of Anthony Albanese's you know, cost of living um, <laughs> crisis plan of attack. The stage three tax cuts, which have now been reworked, to helping uh, lower income, middle income earners in Australia. We also have the inquiry being launched into the supermarkets, so into Woolies and Coles, uh, this investigation around price gouging. So this is how Anthony Albanese says he's gonna help with cost of living pressures in Australia. Let me know if you think this is a workable solution from Anthony Albanese. Uh, this story is a tragic one. This is uh, four people have now been, uh, have died now from drowning. Uh, this is in Phillip Island. If you're in Victoria, every summer we see these drownings in our beaches and in, you know, in, the, in the oceans here where people are going to swim in the sea. And now we have four people dead in one go at these Forest Caves Beach in Phillip Island. Uh, family members were wading in waters of Phillip Island when tragedy struck. A woman in her 40s succumbed to her injuries after drowning off the coast of Phillip Island on Wednesday afternoon. Off-duty life service tried desperately to save the four relatives who got into trouble off the unpat unpatrolled Forest Caves Beach. Three people, two women and a man in their 20s died on the beach, but 43-year-old woman was flown to hospital in critical condition after being re resuscitated on the beach, Ambulance Victoria area manager Paul James said. Victoria police on Thursday confirmed she died in the Alfred Hospital on Thursday. So very tragic. Um, as you can see from this image, I believe this is some of the family members uh, who are there. So three people were from Australia. One was a relative or a friend that was visiting from overseas. Again, we are seeing a mass number of uh, casualties in, in these drowning events in Victoria and around Australia of migrants or newly arrived migrants or tourists to Australia. Uh, a lot of people either aren't good swimmers. Uh, they have no uh, idea about the conditions of the waters in this country. Like I've, I've grown up here my whole life and I'm very careful around water in Australia, particularly as my swimming skills are not the best. So I'm very, very careful, but I have seen when I'm traveling around and uh, I'm on holiday or at uh, destinations like beaches, a lot of people that don't seem that, like they can swim wading off into areas and uh, parts of the, of the water at a beach, especially in unsupervised areas, 
and they're just getting totally caught up in it and you know risking their lives and tragically again we've seen four people this time in one go uh, from one family pass away so we really need uh, education around this. I believe there needs to be a strong push within uh, immigrant, migrant communities in this country who might not fully be aware of the conditions in Australia to really be educated about not wading into waters, particularly in areas where there's no um, two flags, right? There's lifesavers aren't around. Why, why put yourselves in this harm's way and this risk? So very tragic. Uh, again, a warning uh, to all, I believe. Uh, next story I have is uh, Tedros. We've talked about Tedros at the World economic forum you saw him there talking about disease x and one of the proponents of uh, this whole concept around preparing for disease x was that countries need to sign up to the who the world uh, health organization uh, pandemic treaty now tedros is upset these days uh, during recent comments he said that the global global pandemic agreement is at risk of falling apart plans for a global pandemic preparedness agreement risks falling apart amid w wrangling and disinformation according to the chief of the health organization who has warned the future generations may not forgive us shaken by the COVID 19 pandemic the who whose 194 member states decided more than two years ago to start negotiating an international accord aimed at ensuring countries are better equipped to deal with the next health catastrophe or prevent it altogether the plan was to seal the agreement of the, the 2024 health, world health assembly the who's decision making body which convenes on 27th may however ted dross the WHO's Director General said the mon monumentum had been slowed down by entrenched positions and a torrent of fake news, lies and conspiracy theories. <laughs> I think the WHO, Ted Gross, only have him, has himself to blame and his organization, right? All the misinformation, disinformation that we got from these uh, you know, vaccine companies that we got from organizations like the WHO, in some instances, at least the inability to correct some of the information that was being put out there. And the fact that a lot of the junk science that was promoted during COVID-19 and, you know, there was no real legitimacy behind much of that junk science, really, that we've definitely established that today. That is why many countries are facing uh, disgruntled constituents who are questioning their government's willingness to sign up to these treaties, right, that give away sovereignty over types these type of decisions to a world body. People have seen the disastrous consequences of going in with lockdowns. Uh, of mandates and the and the societal harms that it causes on on society right whether it's on the workforce whether it's on people's uh, mental health we have seen the disastrous impacts of many of the policies pushed by organizations like the who so yes there are countries all around the world where the people are pushing back against their government signing up to these type of um declarations now i still think the who will be successful especially with countries like australia canada the us who are in lockstep with these type of policies, right? It's almost like our governments count on being a part of these type of global institutions to wield their power over us in these countries. They just can't help themselves. So I feel like eventually they will get to where they want to get, but it's good to see that there's some issues being faced by the WHO and Tedros in their plans for this global pandemic treaty. Let me know your thoughts. Do you think Australia will end up signing up or do you think we'll also uh, jump out of this? The next story I have is around the Texas border in the US, America, you got to turn on the news. We're talking about immigration. We're talking about the border issues in, in the US. The border czar, Kamala Harris, who is in top of, on, in charge of the border, is completely hopeless. The southern border, you just, you, you know, if I want to go to the US, right, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't get a green card and get there and immigrate. You can just go to the southern border, uh, pay some cartel, right, <laughs> get shipped up uh, um, the southern border, walk up and walk across the border to the US, right? And then they ship you off to some nice hotel in, in America. They give you some money and they look after you. Along the way, you burn your IDs, right? You just you destroy your identity. These aren't even like uh, people from Latin America who are crossing the border. You're having like people from India, people from China, people from the Middle East, all coming through the southern border because it's just a free for all at the moment. So Texas, who has a border on the south, has decided to you know, put barbed wire and take matters into their own hand and defend their border, defend the integrity of their state, because clearly they, they, they don't want this invasion at their border. Now, what's happened since is the, 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 the Supreme Court in America has ruled against Texas' abil Texas ability to do this. But Texas has said uh, they don't care. They're still going to get their um, National Guardsmen there in Texas to keep putting up these barbed wire fences. So there's a bit of a standoff between the Biden administration, the courts and Texas and the governor of Texas, um, Greg Abbott, 
He's written a lengthy letter um, today saying that they will continue. The federal government has broken the compact between the United States and the states. The executive branch of the United States has constitutional duty to enforce federal laws protecting states, including immigration laws, on the books right now. President Biden has refused to enforce those laws and has even violated them. The result is that he has smashed records for illegal immigration. Despite having been put on notice on a series of letters, one of which I delivered to him by hand, President Biden has ignored Texas' demands that he perform his constitutional duties. So yeah, laying out the conditions there, the, the, the distrust of the Biden administration's ability to do this. And now there is a lot of people that say Biden wants open borders. He wants all these immigrants coming in to the US to flood the nation with these immigrants because the, the plan is to turn them into uh, voters for the Democrats, which I mean, it sounds uh, very plausible the way that these things go, right? So again, uh, chaos at the borders there in, in the US and no doubt that will be a major focal point of the upcoming US elections, just based on the amount of staggering amount of migrants now pouring in through their southern border, the invasion. Uh, another news topic that I wanted to touch on is uh, around NATO. So NATO is uh, having massive, uh, you know, exercises, the biggest exercises that they've had in terms of mobilizing and preparing for a conflict since, I believe, uh, the Cold War, according to this article, at least. And to that end, we've also had Sweden, uh, a general in Sweden, saying the population should be on alert and prepared for some type of conflict, which, you know, caused a bit of stir in that country and a bit of uh, rebuking of his position as well. But I've also noticed a trend in the UK. So the UK, a couple of days ago, they had an article saying that Britain must prepare for war. America won't save us this time. Then two days ago, I saw an article that says public face call up if we go to war. Military chief warns, right? So conscription again in, in the UK, potentially. That this is all based around a war or a conflict with Russia, uh, it seems, based around those, those concepts. Uh, today, uh, we've had the, the Prime Minister, Richie Sunak, come out and say to uh, rule out army draft as Russia war threat rises. Downing Street shoots down comments by General Sir Patrick Sanders that the UK must be ready to train and equip citizens for a future conflict. So lots of different mixed messages being thrown around there uh, when it comes to this. But you can see that Europe right now, NATO, the Allies, the US, there is a bit of a shift in terms of preparedness for some type of conflict, uh, which Whatever you want to say about any of this, uh, obviously you would want any nation to be prepared for a conflict. But you know, then I saw this article being shared on uh, Twitter from last year, and this was about the RAF in the UK rejecting applicants because um, they were described as useless white male pilots, and it's impossible to hit diversity targets. So a lot of our military in Australia, <laughs> the UK, the US is very woke today right and do you think we can get conscripts from the type of individuals that we have running around today on TikTok, uh making all types of videos about their you know confusion around their identities and all types of um you know different types of uh obsessions they have with the uh, woke ideologies and virtue signaling do you think those type of individuals can be conscripted into a fighting military force i personally don't believe so we'll need an entire realignment of our values as a society if we would ever face such a scenario or a situation. In Russia, that's not a problem. In China, in parts, many parts of the other worlds in the Middle East, uh, that's not an issue. That's not an issue. Uh, the young generations of those countries are very nationalistic, patriotic, and are ready to fight and defend the things they believe in, whether right or wrong. Let me know your thoughts on this. Are you up to be conscripted into the army to fight in these endless, useless wars by these bankers? Or do you... Um, do you agree that uh, a lot of this is being overplayed at the moment right now and a lot of it's just fear-mongering by the media? Again, guys, I hope you've enjoyed my news update today. You can follow along with my work on YouTube at The Real Rukshan. Hit that subscribe button if you're enjoying this. You can also hit the notification bell because apparently that gives you alerts when I post something and helps with the algorithm. I'm hearing people saying this on X, on Rumble, on uh, Facebook, Instagram. You can follow me also at The Real Rukshan. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys, and enjoy Australia Day tomorrow. See you then. Bye.